Welcome to HD Nation, your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hi, and I'm Robert Heron. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up in today's show, starting with a classic question. Don tweets at HD Nation, was the Time Machine 2002 produced in such a way it could never make its way to Blu-ray or ever make its way to Blu-ray? I've been looking, can't find it online. Don, despite the best efforts of Guy Pearce and Jeremy Irons, your beloved 2002 edition of The Time Machine has the same problem my beloved uh, 1998 movie, The Zero Effect, has, and it ain't production. Let me tell you something. If a copyright holder can find a negative, a print, a digital file, they can get the movie on Blu-ray. Might look like ass without a restoration, but they can digitize and make the compatible files to burn to a Blu-ray master if somebody's willing to pay for it. And that's the problem. It's a money thing. As in, maybe they don't think there's enough box office success to interest the studio to release a Blu-ray. Um, it's kind of funny, though, because you look at, if I go from the Time Machine, right, you can get the DVD for it. Um, I take a look at the Time Machine, domestic gross, 56 million, foreign gross, 66, 67 million dollars, you know, cost 80 million dollars to make. It didn't make a lot of money, but technically it, it should have broken a profit. Uh, it's kind of funny, though. It is always worth searching. The Zero Effect, which, like, nobody saw in 1998, uh, is actually available now in an HD version on Amazon Prime. I was really excited about that because I've only seen DVDs and VHSs of it. Um, you know, it, it's always worth searching. I double checked for the time machine on uh, Can I Stream It? If you haven't been there, this is one of the best sites for finding video ever. Time Machine 2002. And Can I Stream It? gives us the Time Machine 2002. And unfortunately, well, there's a version on Google Play. And that's it. There's the DVD you can rent from Netflix, you can buy on Amazon, and it's nowhere else. And it's kind of unfortunate when one of your favorite movies is not available, um, but I guarantee you... I'm having a similar issue with a movie I absolutely love from way back in the day called Yellowbeard, the best pirate movie ever. Oh my goodness. 1983. And is it available on Blu-ray? Heck no. But no. I can get it on VHS. <laughs> Or DVD. I guess I should get it on DVD at least. Yeah, so. If you've never beer. seen this movie, by the way, I I remember it being quite the funny. I, I should really well, watch it again before I it, recommend it. Hey, at least you can rent it digitally on Amazon, Google, Vudu, or YouTube. I know what I'm going to do. You can doing. buy it on Amazon or Vudu, and you can rent the DVD if you can find it. I'm just saying. There's so many one-liners from that movie I can't say. <laughs> or I, I shouldn't say. <laughs> on a good family-friendly <laughs> show like this. But look, the issue... Unless they can't find a transfer of any type to digitize, um, usually it's legal rights, it's the studio not caring, it's them not thinking it's a market. It's almost never that they can't uh, transfer the movie unless, for example, uh, Metropolis, for years and years and years, nobody actually had a complete copy of the original version. <laughs> then they like, found it, you know, I mean, literally, the stories are fascinating, I will bore you to tears, but generally speaking, uh, somebody wanting to spend the money to digitize a film is almost always the barrier, and, and of course, you know, put up the capital to, to digitize it, burn it to Blu-rays, put those out in the market, make little blue box covers, um, it's money, it's, and hopefully, your movie will make it to the list. One good Guy Pierce success could totally make that happen. Maybe. 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 Hey, and while we're talking Blu-rays, uh, let it be known that Tuesday, October 22nd, 2003 was the day, dun 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 dun, Bruce Lee, the Legacy Collection Blu-ray box set was released with a better HD transfer. Check out Blu-ray.com for the full story behind the internet wailing over these movies. Yeah, uh, the, those were questions about whether the original, some of the original stuff was, it, there was just issues in the original box sets. It's been reissued, but it's... For those of you that waited, that was probably a good move. Well, they actually did, the, they did a recall. Oh, jeez. So, <laughs> it's... This it's, has happened before. It's an interesting read on Blu-ray.com. Check it out if you're a Bruce Lee fan before you drop 100 bucks on the set because it does include the ever-so-awful game of death. It's a good reminder that you still can't just depend on the Blu-ray always being better, if it, especially when they first come out. There may be an issue with it, and it's good to let a few people take a look at that first before you actually spend your own money on it. Not, Usually. Not everything gets the loving treatment it deserves. No, unfortunately not. No. Like Yellowbeard. K2 of A32 asks on Twitter, how do I run a multi-TV setup like the displays in my local big box store? Any suggestions? Well, here is the product you need. And here's an example of a regular HDMI distribution switch. That's so a distribution a switch. switch allows you to choose between multiple inputs, but you only get one of those inputs on your monitor. So you could have your Blu-ray player, your DVD player, your well, you probably don't have HDMI out in your VHS, but you know this could be your Some Apple do. TV, your Roku box, and all of those get yarked out through. Oh, wait, here it is. Output. 
Three inputs, one output, right? It's really, really simple stuff. And they make those with a variety of different selections of inputs. If you need more than just three in, one out, you can get five or eight or whatever you need. An HDMI splitter, however, Bad. has one input and multiple outputs. And that is how they create the wall of televisions broadcasting the same exact thing at your local big box store. Except they probably have one of these with like 28 or 30 or 50 outputs. And a lot of times too, at the stores at least, they're using analog distribution just because it was cheaper and easier in the day. And they can still run HD signal over that as well. Now, uh, here we had that HDMI switch as well. Those are always affordable. It, it don't, it, if you've run out of ports on your TV, mm -hmm. these are the solutions you're looking for, and they come in a variety yes. of shapes and sizes. Really affordable. Most don't support 4K signaling, though, so t take a look at the specs on it if that's going to be a critical move for you right. in terms of uh, feature support. Now, if you want to basically have the best of all worlds, you can get something called a matrix switch, which oh incorporates dear. usually multiple outputs in addition to multiple inputs, and you're able to then configure which displays are going where. A lot of people I know with in the same room having a projection screen and a flat panel display will use a matrix switch so that they can put the content on either display or both if they want. And you still have the ability then to plug in multiple devices into a switch-like device as well. Those tend to be a little more expensive, but if you shop around, especially with groups like Monoprice or look on Amazon, you'll find many of yeah. afford many affordable options out there for that. Switch. Switch. Multiple inputs, one output. Yeah, usually. <laughs> Except for the matrix ones. Splitter. Single input, multiple outputs, matrix switch, all the inputs, all the outputs, so you can mix and match everything in your home theater For the Super collection. Bowl, we'll be using the uh, HDMI splitter, so we can run the projector right. and multiple TVs all showing the same show off of one cable box, or satellite box, or whatever the hell we're doing. So. And the whole question about how do you make a HDMI connection 60 yards long in your 7,000 square foot house? We'll, we'll talk about that sometime. Another day. Yesterday, Robert had the opportunity to fly down to LA, get all hands-on and touchy-feely with Samsung's biggest, baddest 4K, aka UHD TV, the 85-inch Samsung S9 series television. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in asking Mr. Heron, how did Samsung's $40,000 UHD TV look? It's an impressive beast, no doubt. I have to say the design of the S9 is definitely the first thing that grabbed my attention. But before I dive into that, Samsung's curved OLED was also nearby, and I wanted to quickly follow up on the set's multi-view technology that I talked about a couple weeks ago. Now, the Samsung OLED comes with two special sets of glasses, 3D glasses in a scent, but I wanted to show these up close and personal here. The, basically, these 3D glasses also have Bluetooth audio built in. That's the little speaker right there, and those are also removable. The wire actually tucks into the frame quite nicely. Wow. The beauty of that is that basically you can stow it away when, when it's not in use. And basically you can then pick your sources right off the menu there from a variety of inputs. I didn't have any problem selecting two different HDMI inputs. Uh, and basically that was the only thing I had to do. They also had a game console set up too so I could take advantage of some gaming with a second player. Uh, Off-axis performance was pretty much the only issue I had. If you really turn your head really far, uh, you will see issues with that. And like beyond that darker. though... I ended up seeing the other image overlaid on top of it, oh. much, much like in this picture I was just showing. Uh, this okay. actually shows, if you looked at the screen without glasses on, this is how it looks. Uh, both images are being flashed back and forth so quickly as that you see that. In this case, I have a test pattern with grayscale, uh, kind of in the foreground, in the background, you see that cityscape. And here, basically, is holding up the glasses to the screen to show that one person has that view, or in this case, uh, view one, and the second view would be like view two, showing oh, wow. that test pattern. And you have a button right on the frames that you're able to switch back and forth. And other than that, uh, it was pretty darn good. And there's the S9, and I'll get to that in a second. But off-axis performance was one minor issue for the mm -hmm. OLED uh, in terms of just with the glasses on really cranking your head. But if you were even remotely centered up, you're fine. Uh, also, we got into the discussion of burn-in, comparing it to a plasma. Can you burn an OLED screen in? It's, you can pretty much burn in any screen, but we're finding that OLEDs tend to be better than, say, plasmas. Uh, and as far as the glasses go, the only complaint I really had about wearing those and looking at dual or multi-view content was that they lacked a little bit of base punch. But overall, it's, it's a sweet piece of tech that goes beyond just straight 3D. It gives you that multi-view mode where you and another person could totally be right. enjoying something separately. Now. <laughs> Back to the 85-inch S9. <laughs> Together All but alone with your own <laughs> content. And the further in you jam those little earbuds, uh, you just, the whole room just disappears. And you're, you're, in your own, <laughs> you're in your own personal world. Now, for the S9, we're talking ultra-high definition resolution. The stand on this TV is one of the big deals. And let me just show here real quick. The Whoa. stand's base is actually very much like an easel. This, this is the bottom of it, and it reclines back as such. 
integrate it into this stand, and here's the top edge of the stand as well, and then the, the display itself sits in the middle of it, and you can actually height adjust it up and down, as well as angle it forward and backward if you want to. Ooh. Now, in the frame are actually 2.2 channels of audio, uh, two small subs, two speakers, 120 watts. I was pretty surprised at how good it sounds, but for a $40,000 display, it had better sound pretty good. So is it is it wall mountable? Can you can you secure that 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 easel back thing to the floor here in earthquake country or the foot comes off country? the 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 back of the easel that holds it up mm -hmm. will take that off, but it does require the frame actually be attached to the TV in order to wall mount it. Got so it. you can't separate the panel from the frame, unfortunately. Okay. And that, that's something that may or may not turn you off in addition to the price itself. Now, as far <laughs> as picture quality goes, we're talking a full array LED backlighting, which is pretty rare nowadays. That's where there is a grid of LEDs behind the display shining forward compared to edge lit displays, which are the norm. Uh, meaning that you can dim the individual LEDs in the scenes that have dark portions, like in the dark section of this picture, maybe those LEDs get turned off, whereas the ones here depicting the street scene are very well lit, so they can provide that extra bit of brightness. Now, for things like letterboxed movies, that's really where it comes into play. The black bars are inky dark when you're able to turn the lights off completely behind them, and when viewing 4K content. It's window light quality when you can look at that kind of content on a display like this. And I immediately was comparing it to the 1080p sharp 90 inch display that I've spent quite a bit of time with. And when you look at, when you get up close to a 90 inch 1080p screen, you're seeing pixels. You're seeing right. blocky pixels. And if you're not sitting far enough back, it's, it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. With this display, at least with the high resolution content, it, you can get as close to that as you like. And you're going to be enjoying it as such. Was it running at 30 or 60 hertz? It is internally running at 60 hertz, and their upgrade path for this TV, mm -hmm. because it, when it shipped, it didn't have input for a 60 right. hertz 4K signal. Uh, it will be to replace the breakout box. The inputs for this TV are actually in a separate box, oh, and cool. by replacing that box, you're able to then provide it with uh, true 60 hertz input at 4K resolution. I wonder how much that little box is going to cost. That's an unknown, and I couldn't get that question answered, at least today. I'll have that information as soon as possible. How did benchmark? Benchmarks were really good, actually. Because we're talking a, a full array LED system, you get excellent, excellent contrast ratios. Also, the grayscale measurements were very good. And when I actually tapped in the, uh, the Leo Bodner uh, uh, lag tester, it went from 137.9 uh, milliseconds down to 64.6 when game mode was enabled. Not the best, but not terrible either. It's a, it could be better for gamers, but that isn't bad at all. The other thing too, this is a glossy screen, and in some cases here, I actually have, you can actually see some of the lights in the room actually shining off the screen, but these were fairly intense lights, mm -hmm. and it was in no way uh, distracting. It actually did a good job. It didn't completely eliminate it like a matte finished right. screen would or, or other things, but it wasn't completely reflective either. So one of the things you were saying is when you get high definition content scaled to 85 inches, it's really obvious to see the flaws in the content. Without a doubt. In particular, we had not only Blu-ray players, which I will say, Blu-ray content on 4K screens looks great, uh, without a doubt, but we, we also had a uh, satellite uh, feed coming in in HD resolution, and you really could start picking up, wow, this is a much softer looking <laughs> picture. Uh, any artifacts whatsoever, be it compression from the signal or any kind of breakup, oh, well, breakup's easy to see, but compression artifacts right. in particular, and just anything that looks soft overall, you're going to notice that right away. If, if if you are critiquing a piece of video that you've created, you definitely want to look at it on a large screen, no matter what, just because you'll, it makes it easier to see potential problems or artifacts that are in the content. 1080p content at 4K is very similar to 480p content at 1080p, just because you're just scaling a lot of pixels. This is true, yeah. but I will say just having that Blu-ray to start with will get you a lot further in terms of the 4K displays, at, at least at 85 inches. So, okay, I, I want an 85-inch screen, but I'm thinking about the fact that I can pick up a 90-inch sharp in 1080p for five or six grand, what other options are there for 4K at this size? Projectors, right? Yeah, without a doubt. Now, you can go extreme or a little more mild, but 4K <laughs> at this point is still pretty pricey overall. But let's start off with the extreme. Sim 2's Cinema Quattro is 160,000 bucks, <laughs> but it can pump out what I consider to be an amazing 10,000 ANSI lumens, wow. which will light up, a, 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 that's daylight. <laughs> If you've got problems with That's light, cool a, a bright room, this will burn a hole in a screen, almost. Uh, it's beautiful, though. And Sony also has some 4K projectors. They're brand new. 
VW 1100ES is actually coming out for, uh, it's listing here for 28,000. It's gonna be less than that. The, the previous model, the, the 1000 ES was 25K and it was quickly selling for about 20. Now, you do have to pair that with not only a quality screen, you have to do the installation setup and right. perhaps a dedicated room. <sighs> there is some more these expenses are, involved besides just the straight hardware. These but. are not light projectors where you put them on a you know $25 mount from Monoprice. Or, yeah, or, I wouldn't be setting these on a coffee table or something like that and pointing it at the right. wall. This is stuff you really want to do. But if you have $40,000, now think about some of, the, some of the 1080p projectors that are mm -hmm. out there right now. You can get an amazing projector for about half that price, say for about $20,000. Ultra bright, ultra cool. Get the screen with that, the room set up, and the audio. There's a lot you could do if you if you have a forty thousand dollar budget. If you've got more than that, you know, have both and just go that way. But with a five thousand dollar budget, you can do a lot. That's a really what I'm waiting on now. It's I, I do expect without a doubt the prices for four K projectors to start dropping, at least from somebody. But I, I did see one from a company called Wolf that has a twelve thousand dollar projector, and JVC has their new E Shift projectors, which are a little confusing. Really, this is confusing in the sense that yes, it accepts a four K signal, right? But internally, it it's processing 1080p. that back down to ten eighty p, and then scaling it back up to four K. It's putting four K pixels on the screen, but the question is, is can it actually pass through a four K signal without degrading it? And that's something I have yet to see anybody actually test. My gut feeling is no, because right. it, up to this date, it's been using e-shift technology, which is like a pixel doubling technology to get that performance out of it. Consumer price adoption curve, you have a small number of units that are incredibly expensive as the unit price drops. Lots and lots more people have them. We've watched this over and over again. You're on the lookout for a sub $3,000 4K projector next year? I would think so. By the end of next year, somebody should be able to do one. Maybe a single chip system with LCOS technology would probably be the most likely candidate. I don't think, maybe, maybe we'll see a DLP based right. projector in a single chip design. Design. But actually, if it goes LCOS, liquid crystal on silicon, it'll probably be a three-chip design as well, which gives you benefits for brightness and color, which is always nice. I, I prefer a three-chip projector over a single-chip projector any day of the week. Generally speaking, the longer you wait, the less you pay for the cool stuff. And that's it for this episode of HD Nation. Please subscribe. Revision3.com slash HD Nation is the website. You can download it. You can watch it on the website. And hey, we're still up on YouTube. You can still find us at youtube.com slash techfeed. And keep an eye on a little empty website called youtube.com slash HD Nation. That's right. Mm -hmm. Hey, and please email us your comments, questions, or suggestions, or post them right down below. And until next time, thank you for watching.